Would you like free audiobooks? Click the link in the description. Question 1. Clinical Judgment in Identifying Patient Needs A patient with a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, presents with increased shortness of breath, a productive cough, and an oxygen saturation of 88% on room air. What is the priority nursing intervention? A. Administer a bronchodilator. B. Increase the oxygen flow rate to 6 liters per minute. C. Encourage deep breathing and coughing exercises. D. Assess the patient's lung sounds and respiratory effort. Correct answer. D. Assess the patient's lung sounds and respiratory effort. Rationale. The initial step in managing a patient with exacerbated COPD symptoms is to assess their respiratory status, including lung sounds and effort. This assessment guides further interventions such as oxygen therapy, medication administration, or respiratory support. Jumping to interventions without a thorough assessment could lead to inappropriate treatment. Question 2. Safe Medication Administration Before administering digoxin to a patient with heart failure, what is the most important action for the nurse to take? A. Check the patient's potassium level. B. Assess the patient's apical pulse for one full minute. C. Inquire about the patient's appetite. D. Verify the patient's last dose of digoxin. Correct answer. B. Assess the patient's apical pulse for one full minute. Rationale. Before administering digoxin, it is crucial to assess the patient's apical pulse for one full minute to ensure it is not below the safe threshold, usually less than 60 beats per minute for adults. Digoxin affects the heart rate, and administering it to a patient with a low pulse could cause serious cardiac complications. Question 3. Infection Control Techniques Which of the following is the most appropriate hand hygiene technique when providing patient care? A. Washing hands with soap and water for at least 15 seconds. B. Using an alcohol-based hand rub if hands are visibly soiled. C. Washing hands with soap and water after removing gloves. D. Using an alcohol-based hand rub for 20 seconds. Correct answer, D. Using an alcohol-based hand rub for 20 seconds. Rationale. The CDC recommends using an alcohol-based hand rub for 20 seconds as the preferred method for hand hygiene in healthcare settings, unless hands are visibly soiled. This method is more effective in killing germs than washing with soap and water for shorter durations and is less damaging to the skin. Question 4. Implementing Fall Prevention Strategies Which intervention should the nurse prioritize to prevent falls in an elderly patient who is at risk? A. Keep the bed in the lowest position with brakes locked. B. Encourage the patient to wear socks while walking in the room. C. Place a bedside commode far from the bed to encourage mobility. D. Administer sedatives as prescribed to promote rest. Correct answer, A. Keep the bed in the lowest position with brakes locked. Rationale. Keeping the bed in the lowest position with brakes locked is a fundamental safety measure to prevent falls, especially for patients at risk. This ensures that if the patient attempts to get out of bed, the distance to the floor is minimized, and the bed does not move unexpectedly. Question 5. Understanding Patient Rights A patient refuses to take the medication prescribed by their healthcare provider. What is the nurse's best response? A. Explain the consequences of not taking the medication. B. Inform the patient that they do not have a choice. C. Administer the medication without the patient's knowledge. D. Respect the patient's decision and document the refusal. Correct answer, D. Respect the patient's decision and document the refusal. Rationale. Patients have the right to refuse treatment, including medication. The nurse's role is to respect this decision, ensure the patient is informed about the potential consequences of their choice and document the refusal accurately in the patient's medical record. Question 6. Prioritization in emergency situations. A nurse is caring for four patients. Which patient should the nurse see first? 
A. A patient with asthma who has a peak flow reading of 50% of their personal best. B. A patient with a cast for a fractured leg, complaining of discomfort. C. A patient who is post-op day 1, from a cholecystectomy reporting incisional pain. D. A patient with type 1 diabetes, who has a blood glucose level of 58 mg per deciliter. Correct answer, D. A patient with type 1 diabetes, who has a blood glucose level of 58 mg per deciliter. Rationale. The patient with type 1 diabetes and a blood glucose level of 58 mg per deciliter is at immediate risk for hypoglycemia, which can lead to seizures, unconsciousness, or even death if not promptly addressed. This patient requires urgent intervention to raise their blood glucose level. Question 7. Effective communication with patients. A patient expresses fear about an upcoming surgery. What is the most appropriate response by the nurse? A. Don't worry, everything will be fine. B. Why are you afraid? It's a routine procedure. C. Tell me more about what's worrying you. D. You should talk to your doctor about these fears. Correct answer, C. Tell me more about what's worrying you. Rationale. Encouraging the patient to express their concerns, tell me more about what's worrying you, demonstrates empathy and allows the nurse to provide specific information or reassurance tailored to the patient's fears. It fosters open communication and builds trust between the patient and the nurse. Question 8. Delegation to nursing assistive personnel. Which task is most appropriate for the nurse to delegate to nursing assistive personnel? A. Assessing a patient's wound for signs of infection. B. Teaching a patient how to use an incentive spirometer. C. Helping a patient with bathing and dressing. D. Evaluating a patient's response to medication. Correct answer, C. Helping a patient with bathing and dressing. Rationale. Bathing and dressing are tasks that fall within the scope of practice for nursing assistive personnel and do not require the clinical judgment or educational background of a registered nurse. It's appropriate to delegate these tasks to ensure efficient use of resources while the nurse performs more complex care. Question 9. Management of care for a patient with dementia. A patient with advanced dementia repeatedly tries to remove their IV line. What intervention should the nurse implement first? A. Restrain the patient's hands. B. Use a cover that disguises the IV site. C. Frequently reorient the patient to their surroundings. D. Place the patient in a room closer to the nursing station for monitoring. Correct answer, B. Use a cover that disguises the IV site. Rationale. Using a cover that disguises the IV site can help prevent the patient from focusing on the IV line as something to be removed, without restricting their movement. This approach respects the patient's dignity and autonomy while ensuring their safety. Question 10. Understanding legal aspects of nursing. A nurse witnesses a colleague acting in a manner that compromises patient safety. What is the first action the nurse should take? A. Confront the colleague in front of the patient. B. Ignore the behavior, it's not the nurse's responsibility. C. Report the incident to a supervisor or manager. D. Discuss the behavior privately with the colleague. Correct answer, C. Report the incident to a supervisor or manager. Rationale. Reporting the incident to a supervisor or manager is the most appropriate first step as it ensures that the behavior is officially documented and addressed according to hospital policy. It prioritizes patient safety and the integrity of the nursing profession. Question 11. Ethical considerations in end-of-life care. A terminally ill patient's family insists on continuing aggressive treatment, despite the patient's advanced directive requesting no extraordinary measures. How should the nurse proceed? A. Follow the family's wishes, as they are the patient's caregivers. B. Ignore the advance directive since the patient is not conscious. C. Advocate for respecting the patient's advance directive. D. Persuade the family to approve palliative care, instead. Correct answer, C. Advocate for respecting the patient's advance directive. 
Rationale. The nurse has a duty to advocate for the patient's wishes as expressed in their advance directive, even in the face of family opposition. This respects the patient's autonomy and legal rights regarding their own health care decisions. Question 12. Promoting patient mobility. A patient has been on bed rest for several days. What is the most effective intervention to prevent deep vein thrombosis, DVT? A. Keep the patient on strict bed rest. B. Administer prescribed anticoagulants. C. Apply compression stockings. D. Encourage active range of motion exercises. Correct answer, B. Administer prescribed anticoagulants. Rationale. While physical interventions like compression stockings and exercises are important, the administration of prescribed anticoagulants is the most direct and effective method to prevent DVT in a patient who has been on prolonged bed rest. Question 13. Handling medication errors. A nurse realizes they have administered a medication to the wrong patient. What is the first step the nurse should take? A. Document the error in the patient's chart. B. Monitor the patient for adverse reactions. C. Inform the charge nurse or supervisor about the error. D. Apologize to the patient and explain the mistake. Correct answer, B. Monitor the patient for adverse reactions. Rationale. The immediate priority is the safety and well-being of the patient who received the wrong medication. Monitoring for adverse reactions is critical to managing any potential harm. Subsequent steps should include reporting the error and documenting it appropriately. Question 14. Providing culturally competent care. A patient's cultural background includes the use of herbal remedies. What is the best approach for the nurse when integrating this into the patient's care plan? A. Dismiss the use of herbal remedies as unscientific. B. Encourage the patient to only use prescribed medications. C. Assess the patient's use of herbal remedies and discuss any potential interactions with prescribed medications. D. Replace all prescribed medications with the patient's herbal remedies. Correct answer, C. Assess the patient's use of herbal remedies and discuss any potential interactions with prescribed medications. Rationale. It is important for the nurse to acknowledge and respect the patient's cultural practices, including the use of herbal remedies. Assessing and discussing these practices allows the nurse to integrate them safely into the patient's care plan, considering any possible interactions with prescribed medications. Question 15. Nutrition and feeding techniques. A patient with dysphagia is having difficulty swallowing. What intervention should the nurse prioritize to assist with feeding? A. Encourage the patient to eat quickly to reduce mealtime. B. Offer the patient thin liquids to drink. C. Position the patient in a high fowler's position during meals. D. Provide the patient with a straw to drink liquids. Correct answer, C. Position the patient in a high fowler's position during meals. Rationale. Positioning the patient in a high fowler's position, sitting upright, during meals helps to prevent aspiration and facilitates easier swallowing for patients with dysphagia. This position uses gravity to assist in the safe passage of food from the mouth to the stomach. Question 16. Managing patient pain. A patient reports pain at a level of 8 on a scale of 0 to 10 after surgery. What is the first action the nurse should take? A. Administer the highest dose of prescribed pain medication. B. Reassess the patient's pain after 30 minutes. C. Offer the patient a distraction, such as television or music. D. Assess the patient's pain characteristics and location. Correct answer, D. Assess the patient's pain characteristics and location. Rationale. Before administering pain medication, it's important to assess the pain's characteristics, e.g., sharp, dull, throbbing, and location. This comprehensive assessment helps tailor pain management strategies effectively and identify any complications that may be causing increased pain. Question 17. Implementing pressure injury prevention. Which intervention is most effective in preventing pressure injuries in an immobile patient? 
A. Keep the patient's skin dry and clean. B. Apply a barrier cream every two hours. C. Position the patient on their side only. D. Perform regular skin assessments and reposition the patient every two hours. Correct answer, D. Perform regular skin assessments and reposition the patient every two hours. Rationale. Regular skin assessments and repositioning every two hours are critical in preventing pressure injuries. This approach not only helps to identify potential issues early but also reduces prolonged pressure on any one area, which is a primary cause of pressure injuries. Question 18. Effective handoff communication. Which information is most crucial to include in a handoff report to the next shift about a patient who is postoperative day one following a total hip replacement? A. The patient's preference for meal times. B. The patient's mobility status and pain management plan. C. The number of visitors the patient had during the day. D. The patient's opinion about the hospital's room service. Correct answer, B. The patient's mobility status and pain management plan. Rationale. In a handoff report, it's essential to communicate critical information that affects patient care directly. For a postoperative patient, their mobility status and pain management plan are crucial for ensuring continuity of care, preventing complications, and promoting recovery. Question 19. Responding to a patient's emotional needs. A patient who is about to undergo chemotherapy expresses a fear of losing their hair. What is the best response by the nurse? A. You can always wear a wig if that happens. B. Most patients feel this way, but you'll get used to it. C. Let's discuss ways to manage this potential side effect together. D. Hair loss is temporary and will grow back after treatment. Correct answer, C. Let's discuss ways to manage this potential side effect together. Rationale. Addressing a patient's fears about chemotherapy side effects with empathy and support is crucial. Offering to discuss management strategies provides emotional support and empowers the patient by involving them in their care plan. Question 20. Safe blood transfusion practices. Before initiating a blood transfusion, what is the most important action for the nurse to perform? A. Check the patient's temperature. B. Verify the blood type match with another nurse. C. Ensure the IV line is flushed with saline. D. Administer a premedication to prevent allergic reactions. Correct answer, B. Verify the blood type match with another nurse. Rationale. Verifying the blood type match with another nurse is a critical safety step in the blood transfusion process. This double-check system helps prevent transfusion reactions caused by ABO or RH incompatibility, which can be life-threatening. Question 21. Patient Education on Insulin Administration A patient newly diagnosed with diabetes needs to learn how to self-administer insulin. Which teaching method is most effective? A. Provide written instructions only. B. Demonstrate the technique, then have the patient return the demonstration. C. Show a video of the process. D. Explain the process verbally in detail. Correct answer, B. Demonstrate the technique, then have the patient return the demonstration. Rationale. Demonstrating the insulin administration technique and then having the patient perform a return demonstration ensures that the patient understands the process and can safely self-administer insulin. This hands-on approach is more effective than verbal or written instructions alone. Question 22. Recognizing electrolyte imbalances. A patient with chronic kidney disease has a serum potassium level of 6.5 milli equivalent per liter. What is the nurse's priority action? A. Monitor the patient's fluid intake and output. B. Prepare to administer a potassium sparing diuretic. C. Place the patient on a cardiac monitor. D. Increase dietary potassium intake. Correct answer, C. Place the patient on a cardiac monitor. Rationale. A serum potassium level of 6.5 milli equivalent per liter indicates hyperkalemia, which can lead to life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. 
The priority action is to monitor the patient's cardiac status closely while preparing for interventions to lower potassium levels. Question 23. Nursing care for a patient with a chest tube. Which action is most important when caring for a patient with a chest tube? A. Clamp the tube routinely to assess for air leaks. B. Ensure the chest tube is securely taped to the patient's skin. C. Keep the collection device above the level of the chest. D. Frequently assess respiratory status and monitor for signs of distress. Correct answer. D. Frequently assess respiratory status and monitor for signs of distress. Rationale. While all the options are considerations in the care of a patient with a chest tube, frequently assessing the respiratory status and monitoring for signs of distress are critical to detecting complications early, such as pneumothorax or hemothorax, and ensuring prompt intervention. Question 24. Managing a patient with anxiety. A patient experiencing a panic attack has rapid breathing, palpitations, and expresses fear of dying. What is the nurse's best initial action? A. Leave the patient alone to avoid overstimulation. B. Administer an anxiolytic medication immediately. C. Use calm, reassuring communication and guide the patient in slow, deep breathing. D. Encourage the patient to exercise to distract them from their panic. Correct answer, C. Use calm, reassuring communication and guide the patient in slow, deep breathing. Rationale. The best initial action is to use calm, reassuring communication and guide the patient in slow, deep breathing techniques. This approach helps manage the physiological symptoms of a panic attack and can prevent the escalation of anxiety. Question 25. Postoperative care for a patient undergoing abdominal surgery. What is the most important intervention to prevent pulmonary complications after abdominal surgery? A. Limit fluid intake to reduce the risk of fluid overload. B. Keep the patient sedated to ensure rest. C. Encourage the use of an incentive spirometer every two hours while awake. D. Restrict the patient's protein intake to decrease metabolic demand. Correct answer, C. Encourage the use of an incentive spirometer every two hours while awake. Rationale. Encouraging the use of an incentive spirometer every two hours while awake is a key intervention to prevent atelectasis and pneumonia, which are common postoperative complications after abdominal surgery. This helps maintain lung expansion and facilitates effective breathing patterns. Visit nursestudy.net for more nursing practice exams, care plans, and study guides.